and welcome. This is Live Irish Myths. You're very welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library. I'm Anthony Murphy. What episode is this? Is this 272? 273? Wow, I'm losing count. <laughs> Almost like I'm losing count of the years as they fly by. Uh, good evening, good evening. Hello, everybody. You're very welcome to this episode. Sorry, I'm just going to move that. Oh where it used to be um yeah what can i say you may have noticed that uh yesterday in the early hours of yesterday morning we sprung forward here in europe catching up with our friends in the us and canada who sprung forward a couple of weeks ago now the confusion of the time change isn't so obvious uh five hours is the difference again between us and the east coast and eight hours between us and the west coast so if you're watching in New York, it's 3 p.m. for you. And if you're watching in San Francisco, it's 12 noon. Or, of course, the Pacific Northwest. You're very welcome. Tonight, we're returning to uh, Patrick Weston Joyce's Social History of Ancient Ireland. We're continuing the theme of religion in pre-Christian Ireland. We're continuing to talk about Tuatadanon and other pre-Christian deities and uh, spirits, as it were. Hope you enjoy this. As always, if you wish to support Mythical Ireland, please do consider becoming a patron. You can sign up over at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. That is the address that is scrolling along the bottom of the screen constantly throughout the broadcast. Glad to report that Patreon has been a hive of activity lately. Uh, so, for example, if you're at the Bronze Age level or above today, you got a special five minute video showing the re emergence of the crop marks at Newgrange Farm, showing the drone hinge, the four poster, the Great Palisade, and the other hinge, LP2, which have re emerged in a crop of winter wheat, which is becoming established in that field. That's the first time there's been wheat in the field since the year of the discovery when torp wheat was the crop. Uh, and of course, that was uh, July. Uh, 2018, uh, uh, the 10th of July, 2018. Hard to believe that that is not too far away from being six years ago. That is just really incredible. Also to mention that if you wanted to learn more about the story of Drone Hinge and its discovery and some interpretation of its possible meaning and use and its probable reference in mythology, uh, then uh, I did publish a book in 2019 called Drone Henge, the story behind the remarkable discovery at Newgrange. And you can order a signed copy of that on the website right now at the link that I have just shared on YouTube and Facebook. If you are watching on YouTube, please do subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell so that you get notified, not just of future uh, live streams, but of course video uploads, the latest upload for the YouTubers, uh, was a short video uh, shot in January showing Karen T and the the other Cairns at Schlievnikalia at Loch Crew in the winter frost, uh, and that already seems like a distant memory, even though it's only it's less than three months ago. Extraordinarily, you may also have noticed if you're paying close attention that it's not dark here. Uh, the blind is up and the curtains are open, and it's very dull. And it is getting dark here, but this is the first episode probably since October, I would say, uh, that uh, we've been starting when it's not dark here. So brilliant. Spring is arriving and spring weather too. And after a very uh, cloudy and uh, quite wet winter. I'm glad to report that we've had quite a lot of sunshine in the last number of days, and that has been a sight to behold, I can tell you. First in the house tonight is, as usual, Elaine Dent Lingenfelter, who says, Hello, Anthony and the Tua. Nice day here. 77F, 25 cents. Oh, my God. Like That's a that's a balmy summer's day in Ireland. That's about the best it gets. We're getting ready for the total solar eclipse next Monday, hoping to get photos to share. Brilliant stuff. Hope you get that. I hope... Uh, there's no clouds, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, an extraordinary thing to uh, witness. I The closest I came was like a 92 or 93% covered sun, but never a total eclipse. Uh, Wayne Bird is also in the house. Good evening, Anthony. Hello, everyone. Hope you are all well. All a good form, Wayne. 
Good to see you over on Patreon as well. One of the best interactors, if we could invent such a word, on the posts at Patreon. Glad to see that you are enjoying all that. I am so excited about the eclipse, says Elaine. Wish you could be here to see it. Well, me too, but your luck, you know. Uh, maybe we'll watch a live stream. Rex Fortenberry is saying, howdy all. Spring is in the air. Blessed be. And thank goodness the time changed back to normal-ish. Agree wholeheartedly, Rex. Anna L is saying, haha, I'm first today. No. Uh, you're, oh, maybe. Are you watching on the Mythical Ireland community by any chance? Um, hmm. Sorry, you're not first. But anyway, come here. Let's pretend you are. Anna L, brilliant to see you. Oh, wow. Brilliant. First commenter. Uh, good evening to, to, to uh, turned out to be a nice day here in Balbriggan. According to my Polish tradition, I splash some virtual water all over the tour. I like that. That's better than April Fool's jokes. I can tell you, I've had enough of them. Every second thing on social media today is an unbelievable story. Literally unbelievable. Guido Bruce is in the house. Good evening, all. It's been a while for me. Been too busy. I know the feeling, uh, Guido, but it's great to see you. And thanks for joining us. Lily Shambles is watching on YouTube. Happily, the rain stopped for a few hours. And then the sun actually came out briefly. Brilliant. Great stuff. Spread it around. Desiree Riley has joined us. Hello to all the two. A happy everyone. Ho sorry. Hope everyone had a happy Easter. Yes, indeed. Hope you all had plenty of eggs uh, or something nice. And yes, um, hard to believe. Uh, we're kind of past Easter as well. The year's flying around. Joe Butler, Auntie Joe, saying hello from a cloudy Colorado. That sounds very Irish, because right here and now, the sky is completely overcast. It's grey as far as the eye can see. But there you go. That's Ireland. Sandra Boothroyd says, evening and happy to be with you all. Well, we are glad to have your company, Sandra. Uh, is it Karen... Uh, McMahon, I'm not sure if I have the pronunciation of that correct, but you're very welcome. And thanks for joining us, watching on Facebook. Uh, I think this might be your first time. And uh, yeah, enjoy it. I hope you hope you feel very welcome. Anne McCallum is saying hello, Anton, and all the mighty two. I hope everyone had a wonderful long Easter weekend. It's lovely, sunny. It's a lovely, sunny 10 Celsius today. That's not bad at all. Looking forward, as always, to story time. Brilliant stuff, Anne. Always a pleasure. Valentina Bernardi is saying good evening from Glastonbury. Yes, indeed. The Isle of Avalon shines its light across the world and across the sea to all of us here in Erin. And Scott Doherty says happy Monday, everyone. And same to you and to Bill. Valentina says happy Easter to all that celebrate. Yes, indeed. Many happy returns. Barb Jordan is in the house. Hello, Barb. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Michael Pike has joined us. Banathy Anthony August Natua. Goramila Mahagut, a we call. Helen Hirsch Ch Chader says, 273. Hi, Anthony and friends. Glad we have caught up time wise, but I'm really looking forward to the end of our latest snowstorm. Wow. Is that still a thing? Obviously, it is. Yeah, I'd say you are. Bring on the summer. Sotonar says, Nev Banathi Nadini Bra. Good evening to you, Sotonar. You're very welcome. Hope you're in good form. Tom King has joined us on Gawa. Hello there, Anthony and the mighty Tua. A grand day in the Boyne Valley. With delight, sorry, daylight even, with daylight at the forge for the broadcast. Fantastic. Enjoy story time, my friends. Brilliant. Yeah, I was just saying that. It's not dark yet. Amazing stuff. Summer's coming. Tuesday Thompson wishes us all a happy Mythology Monday. Many happy returns. Mariana Dunn says hello to Tom. And everybody's having a great chat, which is brilliant. Brendan Byrne is just home from work in time for the Mythical Ireland. For Mythical Ireland, yippee. Greetings, everyone. Great stuff, Brendan. Hope they didn't work you too hard. I hope you're not too tired. Nancy Wells Brewer has joined us. Hi to the two from Orinda, California. Love seeing sunshine here today. Yes, indeed. And long may it last. Well, you know, with the odd sprinkling of rain to help. Alva Kelly says, Banathi Natua Galair. Uh, Alva, you're very welcome. Michael is saying reception of Facebook is spotty, stops a lot. I wonder, is that uh, across the board or is that just Michael? Is that his connection? Or I wonder, is our other people having uh, the same experience? Mariana says, Vanity dear to and Anthony from Overcast, Alexandria, Virginia. We are finished with our singing for Easter week. Yes, indeed. All done and dusted for now, says you. Sandra Boothroyd is here, but hasn't said anything, but she will. Uh, Linda... Cosma says, Gee, you have happy Easter week. Banatina Koska, Orov. 
Golair more Harja. Sean Satanta DC is saying hello from Wexford, everyone. Up the Wex, up the Wexford boys. Uh, Karen, yes. Thank you. Yes to all pronouncing and first time. Wow. Brilliant stuff. I'm delighted to hear that. Betty Wood is in, in the morning time in Honolulu in Hawaii. Now, how far in time? Let me just quickly check. How far behind? It's still morning there. So Hawaii. Kilo Hotel 6. Is... It's not 4.38 a.m. there, is it? No, it isn't. Don't mind me. Uh, yeah, what time is it there, uh, Betty? And you're very welcome. Uh, good morning to you. You're just starting your day. Uh, we're at the back end of it. Amazing stuff. Isn't the internet a wonderful thing? Um, Sheila Gunn managed to get on, albeit maybe a short visit. Happy Easter to Anthony and the Thua. Many happy returns, Sheila, and thank you as always for everything that you do michelle said hello to the tour from the manic mountains of colorado it can't decide if it wants to snow rain be sunny or be cloudy that's spring in colorado <laughs> that's ireland all year round uh, except for the snow uh, michelle you're very welcome thanks for joining us adina sparks has joined us is saying afternoon rainy and cool day in new mexico i refuse to believe it no rain and cool in new mexico no way no sorry just you're gonna to have to send us a picture to prove it adina you're very welcome um facebook is fine for me says karen paul mcfeely has joined us also on facebook hope we're all well fine fettle here paul sure can't complain too loudly grace q saying hi happy easter week many happy returns to you grace thanks for joining us betty wood is saying 9 a.m wow so 11 hours is that right uh, eight plus three yeah 11 hours behind. Wow. Uh, very good morning. And I uh, hope it's a great day for you. Theresa Collins says, hi, Anthony and the two. Uh, looking forward to Mythical Monday, as are we. Glad you're able to join us. Technical difficulties have gone. Michael Pike is delighted to announce. Brilliant stuff. Connie Orr, is that Connie Reader? Saying happy April Fool's Day. Yes, I was caught very nicely last night. Very nicely, I have to say. Best April Fool's prank that was pulled on me in a long time. Uh, uh, Tom King is busy making 70 shields and uh, preparing for battle, apparently. The, the Battle of Bohermine. I've no doubt that you'll win because you'll have the two of the Danon on your side. Kathleen Gallagher is saying, hello, Anthony and all. You're very welcome, Kathleen. Thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's we're all up to date so far. Uh, no major announcements. Uh, just to say that the first of this seasons newgrange farm archaeological park and newgrange chamber tours gets underway tomorrow there are still some tickets left it's not too late if you wanted to uh if you're in ireland and you thought you could get to newgrange farm for half 12 tomorrow lunchtime you can book tickets at this link that i'm just going to share um still some tickets available on tomorrow's tour we have tours <coughs> excuse me I'll tell you now when we have tours, as soon as the page loads. We have tours on the Tuesday, the 2nd of April, Friday, the 19th of April. That's the only Friday date so far. We may get more dates if they all sell out. Uh, Tuesday, the 30th of April. Do you know what? I'm sorry for doing this live on the live stream. Live on the live stream, yes. Uh, nah, 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 nah. Okay um tuesday the 14th of may and tuesday the 28th of may tuesday the 11th of june and tuesday the 25th of june tuesday the 9th of july and tuesday the 23rd of july and tuesday the 6th of august and tuesday the 20th of august so if you're interested in joining me on a special tour uh we get to go inside new grange and then we get a tour on the tractor trailer and talk about the monumental megalithic Neolithic and mythological landscape of Newgrange Farm, which occupies a significant portion of the Bruna Bonia landscape. And of course, we'll be talking about all those discoveries of six years ago and a lot more besides. Hope you can join us. Get your tickets now before they're completely sold out if you're interested in any of those dates. And don't forget, there's lots and lots of extra stuff on Patreon 
if you should wish to become a patron. Anyway, let us get going, as they say. I am back to a social history of ancient Ireland. This is our 21st reading from this book, and I make that still not just quite. So this is what we've read. This is what we haven't read. I make it not just quite halfway yet, believe it or not. There is uh, possibly 50 episodes in this. But we can dip in and out. Uh, we, 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 we explored other, other things during St. Patrick's Week. Alan Hoskins is just setting out from Athenry to Ballina Killaloo. So we'll catch up later. <laughs> Excuse me. Hope all are keeping well. All good here, Alan. Hope you have... Sorry. Hope you have a safe journey home. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you on the replay, as they say. Uh, thanks for giving us the shout out. So we last week had read about the bow or the bow. How was that? How, how did we say it was pronounced bow? Yeah, bow or bow or the bow. Uh, so mm, this week we will continue on. And this is a continuation of the theme of religion, learning and art. And specifically, this section is called, let me remind myself while also reminding you, this section is called, what is it called? What is it called? We've been reading it for a while. It's called Mythology, Gods, Goblins and Phantoms. Hmm. Goblins, not such a good word to use in the context of Irish mythology, but there you go. Uh, seems like you had a good tea slash dinner tonight, Anthony. You're making me paranoid now. Yes, indeed. I did. I had a lovely dinner. I participated quite significantly in its making. Nech, N-E-I-T, says Cormac's glossary, was the god of battle with the pagans of the Gael. Nemon was his wife. In another part of the glossary, it is stated that Nemon was otherwise called Bainech, B-E hyphen N-E-I-T, and that she was a bow. And in O'Cleary's glossary, she is called Bauv of Battle, or a Fenog, F-E-N-N, -N, O Father, G. <coughs> <coughs> but as being Netch's wife, she was probably the chief Bauv, or war goddess, of all. Netch and Nemon were malignant beings. Both are bad. A venomous couple, truly, were they, says Cormac, and hence is said, as a maledictive wish among the Irish, be niche, attend on thee. Wow. Just getting the old pencil out so I can make the uh, the margin markings. <laughs> Don't forget that Cormac was a churchman, so he might have been a little bit biased in these matters. The Bows were not the only war goblins. Goblins, a terrible word. There was a class of phantoms that sometimes appeared before battles bent on mischief. Uh, and I'm not sure if she's actually specifically mentioned, but in the graphic for today's episode is the Morrigan. More Riagon, uh, who is a significant uh, deity uh, of the ancient myths. Before the Battle of Moilena, 2nd century, three repulsive-looking witch hags with blue beards appeared before the armies, hoarsely shrieking victory for Con the Hundred Fighter, Con Cade Cahach, and defeat and death for the rival king, Owen. We read of malignant beings of this kind in connection with Christianity also. At the Battle of Mokriva, a.d. 250 the air over the heads of the combatants was black with demons waiting to snap up and carry off the souls of sinners and even the fact that it says you know demons waiting for the souls of sinners that sounds like something only a christian scribe could write to be honest and i'd say that is an exaggeration and a probably a a uh, uh, a, a, a corruption of what was originally said. What's the matter with blue beards, says Rex? Well, uh, blue is an unusual colour for a beard, and secondly, women aren't supposed to have beards. But forgive me if I've spoken out of turn. Uh, Mavanway says, good eve all. 
Hope you all had a lovely Easter. I'm half asleep with the change of the clocks and a late night, but listening in for a bit. I'm reading George MacDonald's stories at the moment, full of goblins. Brilliant stuff, Mavanway. Were you, was it you or was it somebody else? Were you in Ireland in the past week? Or was that somebody else that I saw sharing something that they visited up north? Forgive me if it was somebody else. I am very easily confused at my age, my advancing age. I passed the half century last week, as you know. T has joined us and is offering tea all round. Thank you very much. I'll have a cappuccino. <laughs> While only two angels attended to bear away in the other direction the few souls they could claim. Ah, wide is the path that leads to destruction. Straight is the gate that leads to salvation and all of that. If I was in Ireland, you'd have known about it. Yeah, it wasn't you. It was someone else. I can't remember. Uh, anyway, it'll come back to me. As I said, at my age, I forget things. Just before the banquet of Dunning Edge, uh, Moirath, two horrible black spectral beings, a man and a woman, both belonging to hell, uh, came to the assembly and having devoured an enormous quantity of food, cursed the banquet, after which they rushed out and, and vanished, which, by the way, is a well-known ploy for not paying the bill. <laughs> I added that bit. But they left their baleful trail, for at that feast there arose a deadly quarrel which led to the Battle of Moirath. AD 637. Even so late as the 14th century, some of the historical tales record apparitions of this kind. But this may possibly be nothing more than an imitation of the older tales. In Macraith's account of the Wars of Thomond, we read that when the clan Brian Roe were marching to their destruction at the impending Battle of Doolin in Clare, AD 1317, they saw in the middle of a ford a hideous, gigantic-looking hag. I'm making a margin note here. Apologies. Quote, with grey, dishevelled hair, blood draggled, and with sharp, boned arms, and fingers crooked and spare, dabbling and washing in the ford, where mid-leg deep she stood, beside a heap of heads and limbs that swam in oozing blood. Sounds like the washerwoman at the ford, doesn't it? And when they asked who she was, she told them in a loud croaking voice that she was the washer of the ford and that the bloody human remains she was washing were their own heads and limbs which should be lopped off and mangled in the coming battle on which she vanished before the terrified eyes of the soldiers. Now, I'm just saying, folks, if ever you're going to battle and you meet a, a hag washing something in the ford and she talks like that, uh, well, get the hell out of there. Don't even bother fighting. Flee. Run. Run for your lives. Run for the hills. Get the fastest path out of there you can possibly beat. In many remote, lonely glens, there dwelt certain fierce apparitions, females called geniti glini, genii or sprites of the valley, singular genit, g-e-n-i-t, plural geniti, uh, and others called bochamachs, male goblins, and bananachs, females, often in company with jevna air or demons of the air. Ooh. Anywhere I see the word demon, I always think that's a Christian person's way of describing something that to them uh, is a threat to their religion. At any terrible battle crisis, many or all of these, with the other war furies described above, were heard shrieking and howling with delight, some in the midst of the carnage, some far off in their lonely haunts. Just before one of Cuchulain's fierce onslaughts, the Bochanachs and the Bananachs and the Gen Geniti Glini and the demons of the air responded to his shout of defiance, and the Nemon, i.e. the Bauv, 
confounded the army of Maeve, Cucullin's enemy, so that the men dashed themselves against the points of each other's spears and weapons, and 100 warriors dropped dead with terror. Wow. Yeah, who's it the same that Rex? Run away! Run away! It's what's the rabbit called in the cave? Yeah, five of us went down, five of us got killed, and five of us came back. Yeah. In the story of Fled Brecru or Brickru's feast, we are told how the three great red branch champions. Lera, the victorious Conal Kernach and Cuchulain, contended one time for the Korathmir, or Champion's bit, bit, which was always awarded to the bravest and mightiest hero. This is the one that's often uh, described or translated as the Champion's portion. And in order to determine this matter, they were subjected to various severe tests. Algebra. Or advanced uh, advanced trigonometry, electronic circuits. There, there's a test. Uh, I'm joking about the the nature of the severe tests. On one of these occasions, the stern-minded old chief Samera, who acted as judge for the occasion, decided that the three heroes separately should attack a colony of Geniti Glini that had their abode in a neighboring valley. The killer rabbit in the cave of Ker Banog. That's the one. Yeah. Brilliant. Lera went first, but they instantly fell on him with such demoniac ferocity that he was glad to escape half naked, leaving them his arms and battle dress. Obviously, his weapons, not his, lit literally his arms. <laughs> Colonel Kernock went next, and he too had soon to run for it. But he fared somewhat better, for though leaving his spear, he bore away his sword. Lastly, Cuchulain, and they filled his ears with their hoarse shrieks. And falling on him tooth and nail, they broke his shield and spear and tore his clothes to tatters. At last he could bear it no longer, and showed plain signs of yielding. His faithful charioteer, Leg, was looking on. Now, one of Leg's duties was, whenever he saw his master about yielding in a fight, to shower reproaches on him, so as to enrage him the more. On this occasion, Boo! Coward! Get back in there! On this occasion, he reviled him so vehemently and bitterly for his weakness and poured out such contentious nicknames on him that the hero became infuriated and, turning on the goblins once more, sword in hand, he crushed and hacked them to pieces so that the valley ran all red with their blood. Which I take it to mean that Cuchulain got the champion's portion. The class of fairies called Shivra, who were also the Danons, a sort of disreputable poor relations of Mananon and the Dagda, were powerful, demoniac, and dangerous elves. And when I see that, and I think about who wrote it originally, and the fact that they were undoubtedly a Christian monk or some sort of an ecclesiastic. I think, wow, powerful, demoniac, and dangerous. Dangerous to who exactly? More dangerous to you, Mr. Christian Scribe Writer, probably than anyone else. They are mentioned in our earliest literature, in the 8th or 10th century story of the Shiavar Chariot of Cuchulain, in the Book of the Dun Cow. St. Patrick tells King Lyra that the apparition he sees is not a Shivri, but Cuchulain himself. To this day, the name is quite familiar among the people, even those who speak only English. And they often called a crabbed little boy, small for his age, a little Shivra, exactly as Conor McNessa 
19 centuries ago, when he was displeased with the boy Cúchulain, calls him a, this looks like a Latin word, sirit, sirit, S-I-R-I-T-E, uh, shivarhi, a little imp of a shivra, siriche, siriche, shivarhi, a little imp of a shivra. The Shivras were often incited by Druids and others to do mischief to mortals. In revenge for King Cormac MacArthur's leaning towards Christianity, the Druids let loose Shivras against him, who choked him with the bone of a salmon while he was eating his dinner. And certain persons, being jealous of a beautiful girl named Aiga, set, uh, set even, that's A I G E, set Shivras on her who transformed her into a fawn. Fascinating stuff. The leprechaun, as we now have him, is a little fellow whose occupation is making shoes for the fairies. And on moonlight nights, you may sometimes hear the tapping of his little hammer from where he sits, working in some lonely nook among the bushes. If you can catch him, and keep your gaze fixed upon him, he will tell you, after some threatening, where to find a crock of gold. But if you take your eyes off him for an instant, he is gone. The leprechauns... The leprechauns are an ancient race in Ireland, for we find them mentioned in some of our oldest tales. The original name was Lucorpon from Lu Little and Corpon, a diminutive of Corp, a body, Latin corpus, a wee little body. A passage in the Book of the Dun Cow, inserted, of course, by the Christian redactor, informs us that they were descended from Ham, the son of Noah. Uh, right. Quote, it is from him, Ham, descended Lucropons and Fomorians and Goatheads and every other ill-shaped sort of men. Sounds like something from Lord of the Rings, doesn't it? Unquote. Mm. And that's quoted any archaeological journal, uh, 1872 to, uh, to 3. And now we're here at page 2A bottom they could do mischief to mortals such as withering the corn setting fire to houses snipping the hair of women's heads clean off and so forth but were not prone to inflict evil except under provocation brendan bird i do agree goblin doesn't sit well from the beginning, as their name implies, they were of diminutive size. For example, as they are presented to us in the ancient tale of the death of Fergus MacLeage. Their stature might be about six inches. In the same tale, the king of the leprechauns was taken captive by Fergus and ransomed himself by giving him a pair of magic shoes, which enabled him to go under the water whenever and for as long as he pleased. Just as at the present day, a leprechaun, when you catch him, which is which is the difficulty, will give you heaps of money for letting him go. No doubt the episode of the ransom by the magic shoes in the old story is the original version of the present superstition that, that the leprechaun is the fairy's shoemaker. The leprechauns of this particular story live in a beautiful country under Loch Rory, now Dundrum Bay, off the coast. Of County Down, just in case you're looking for one. In modern times, the Puka, he spells it P-O-O-K-A, but I think the Irish is P-U Father C-A, has come to the front as a leading Irish goblin. But I fear he is not native Irish, as I do not find him mentioned in any ancient Irish documents. Interesting, isn't it? I'm taking an, another margin note.
He appears to have been an immigrant fairy brought hither by the Danish settlers. For we find in the Old Norse language the word pookie, meaning an imp, which is no doubt the origin of our puka and of the English puck. But like the Anglo-Norman settlers, he had not long lived in this country till he became, quote, more Irish than the Irish themselves, unquote. For an account of his shape, character and exploits, I must refer the reader to Crofton Croker's Fairy Legends and to the first volume of My Origin and History of Irish Names of Places. That's Joyce's uh, place names in three volumes, volume one. You're all very quiet. There's hardly been a comment for the last six minutes. There hasn't. What's going on? Have we lost connection? You're all very quiet. It's like you're under a spell or something. Or maybe I started to put you all to sleep by yawning, uh, for which I do apologise. When the Milesians landed in Ireland, they were encountered by mysterious sights and sounds wherever they went through the subtle spells of the Daedanans. Yep, yeah, Elaine says, listening. Good stuff. John Inman has joined us. Pesky goblins. The Tibetans have these spirits. Leprechauns are called twer twerangs, a kind of wealth spirit. Interesting stuff. Everyone is quiet today. Yeah. All engrossed, apparently. Yeah. I'm under a spell for sure, says Joe. <laughs> no, I'm pottering around and listening, but I did spot you stifling that yawn, Anthony. Apologies. So what I'm going to do when I start yawning now is I'm just going to go... Oh, I didn't really get the timing of that right, did I? Excuse me. Hey, presto. As they climbed over the mountains of Kerry, as I was flying over far-flung Kerry mountains, Donald Gavin is watching from Hudson Valley, New York, enjoying the reading. Hello, Donald. On the other side of the ocean now. What a pleasure it was to meet you last week. Sometime, I think. And uh, glad you got home safe. And great to see you watching the old live stream. Uh, Alva Kelly says, hi, I'm sorry. I'm trying to assemble Ikea, Ikea furniture while I'm listening. Did I tell you that I recently went for a job interview? Uh, I was going to work for Ikea. And uh, when I arrived, I was brought into an office where the manager said, come in, make a seat. As I was going over the far-flung Kerry Mountains, I met Captain Farrell and his money he was counting. I first produced me pistol and I then produced me rapier, saying stand and deliver for you are a bold deceiver. Musher ain't a do da ma da. <clears throat> for more, listen to the Dubliners. Tom King does a mean, mean Luke Kelly. I mean, he's just brilliant on the old banjo. As they climbed over the mountains of Kerry, half-formed spectres flitted dimly before their eyes. For Banba, the queen of one of the three Dedanan princes who ruled the land. Okay, as in the wife of one of the princes, yeah. Doesn't mention the fact that she's one of a triplicate of deities. Anyway, does that explain the singing? No. Oh dear. <laughs> Come in, make a seat. <laughs> I know, right? Ola Conrad is watching from Denmark. Hope the singing and the stupid joke haven't put you off, uh, Ola. <laughs> um, sorry, I'll read it again. Uh, for Bamba, the queen of one of the three Dedanan princes who ruled the land, sent a swarm of meshi, or phantoms. Oh, sorry, we seem to have a sudden interruption. I thought I was going to be on. <laughs> Which froze the blood of the invaders with terror. And the mountain range of Schlievmish near Tralee still retains the name of those apparitions. Apparently mentioned in Cormac's glossary. Wow, late 9th century. Apparently Barb uh, loves the singing and the song. Uh, not at all, says Ola. Well, it's a good job, isn't it? There's whiskey in the jar. Jolly. Yes, indeed. 
in uh, sorry O'Cleary's glossary explains Messi M E I S E not to be confused with Lionel Messi one of the greatest soccer players in the world uh, explains Messi as meaning shivra or phantom forms such as might be spectral bodies that rise from the ground the Dedanans could also command the services of whole clouds of Urtrochta malignant sprites and uh I don't know how to pronounce that. Guidjamain, G-U-I-D-E-M-A-I-N, which last name, according to Cormac's glossary, was applied to spectres and fairy queens. Ah, uh, come on now, bring back the yawns. Fair enough, that'll happen before too long, I'll tell you. The early biographers of the Irish saints fully believed that in the pagan times, Ireland was infested by numberless demons and evil spirits, just as they believed in the necromantic powers of the Druids, which we can hardly wonder at, seeing that the belief in witches and witchcraft was universal all over Europe down to a late period. Of those evil beings and of the early Christian notions regarding them, Jocelyn, a monk of Furness in Lancashire, who wrote a life of St. Patrick, in the 12th century, gives a very vivid and highly coloured picture. He tells us that before the time of St. Patrick, Ireland was troubled with a threefold plague of reptiles, demons and magicians. <laughs> now, which hat, which, which cup is the ball under? <laughs> a plague of magicians. Uh, you'll like it, but not a lot. Uh, the early Irish version of Paul Daniels by three, maybe. As for reptiles, quote, these venomous and monstrous creatures used to rise out of the earth and sea and so prevailed over the whole island that they wounded both men and animals with their deadly stings, often slew them with their cruel bitings and not seldom rent and devoured their members. I'm not going to ask what that means. Moving swiftly on, the demons used to show themselves unto their worshippers in visible forms. They often attacked the people, inflicting much hurt, and only ceased from their baleful doings when they were appeased by foul, heathenish prayers and offerings. After this, they were seen flying in the air and walking on the earth, loathsome and horrible to behold, in such multitudes that it seemed as if the whole island were too small to give them standing and flying room, whence Ireland was deemed the special home of demons. Wow, come on lads, give it a feckin' rest, will you? Less of a feckin' Christian anti-feckin' anti-pagan stuff. And lastly, the magicians, evildoers, and suits heirs abounded beyond what history records or any other country on the face of the earth. Wow. Uh, just ease, ease off on the old anti-pagan juice there, Mr. Christian Scribe, will you, for a second? Come on. Mark Gordon has joined us from Iowa. Good afternoon, Mark. Instead of the blackouts, I mean, not forcing yawns on anyone. Fair enough. <laughs> I wasn't expecting a serenade to the faithful, no. Uh, yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? That's a, a highly exaggerated paragraph, basically saying that before St. Patrick, Ireland was full of foul demons. Whole place was packed with them. More packed than any other place on the earth. Come on, give us a break. What with Daedanon gods, with war gods and goddesses, apparitions, demons, sprites of the valley, Ordinary ghosts, <laughs> ordinary, what bed sheets thrown over the head, <laughs> spectres and goblins, fairies of various kinds, shivras, leprechauns, banshees, and so forth. There appears to have been quite as numerous a population belonging to the spiritual world as of human beings. In those old pagan days, Ireland was an eerie place to live in, and it was high time for St. Patrick to come. Oh my God, give me a break said the greatest Christian propagandist ever.
And yet, when the Christians came, don't forget the reality here, folks, just in case anybody's watching this and goes, yeah, 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 these clearly represent the pagans and St. Patrick committed genocide against the pagans and all that. That's not what really happened. What really happened was when the Christians came to Ireland, they lived among the pagans. The Druids and the Christians lived and worked side by side. And a lot of the pagan uh, feast days and uh, rituals were incorporated into the Christian church. That's what happened in reality. Don't let a story get in the way of the... Uh... Don't let the facts get in the way of a good story, should I say. Um. So somebody sent me a message saying, so Drone Henge has reappeared. Do I sense an aptly Easter-themed book? Drone Henge, The Resurrection. <laughs> yeah, what a time, actually. Easter Sunday. That's, I never even thought of it. Yes. Easter Sunday. Of all the days. It's definitely a resurrection. Anne McCallum's live stream just went dead. And momentarily it said, it's back now. Couldn't deal with the hyperactive Christian overload against the poor pagans and their sprites and goblins and demons. Yes, indeed. Catchy title, says Michael Pike. Yes. Drone Henge, the resurrection. So we're mo moving on to a section called Worship of Idols. And of course, as soon as you see those words, Worship of Idols, you absolutely know this has got to be Christian. It's a Christian who's writing this. So bear with us. Idols were very generally worshipped. The earliest authentic document that mentions idols is St. Patrick's Confession, or his Confessio, if you like, in Latin, in which the great apostle himself speaks of some of the Scots, i.e. Irish, who up to that time, quote, had worshipped only idols and abominations, unquote. Yum. And elsewhere is the same document, in the same document, he speaks of the practice of idol worship as a thing well known among the Irish. The tripartite life informs us that Tara was, in the time of the saint, the chief abode of, quote, idolatry and druidism, which we mentioned in our recent episode about St. Patrick broadcast on the week of St. Patrick's Day. In the same work, the destruction of many idols is mentioned as part of Patrick's life work. And a story is told of two maidens, Christian converts, who were persecuted and finally drowned by a tyrannical petty king for refusing to worship idols. There was a great idol called Crom Croch, covered all over with gold and silver in my schlecht, the plain of prostrations. Near the present village of Ballymagarran in the county Cavan, surrounded by 12 lesser idols covered with brass or bronze. In our most ancient books, there are descriptions of this idol. Crom Croch is the name given to it with some slight variations in different passages of the Book of Leinster. By the way, we did an episode on Crom Croch, which you can look up by searching on the YouTube channel. The Mythic of Ireland YouTube channel, of course, the one that you YouTubers are watching it on right now. Crom Croak is the name given to it with some slight variation of different passages in the Book of Leinster. It is called Ken Croach in the tripartite life. Jocelyn calls it Kian Crohi, and in Colgan's third life of St. Patrick, it is Kenerva, which, however, Todd thinks is likely an error of transcription. <laughs> yeah, wow, it turns out that the Christian scribes also made mistakes. In a very old legend found in the Dinchemachus in the Book of Leinster, it is related that many centuries before the Christian era, King Chirnvas and crowds of his people were destroyed in some mysterious way as they were worshipping it on Samhain Eve, the eve of the 1st of November. See also Annals of the Four Masters, AM 3656. So for a moment, let's take a break. Little breather. I need to get up and just pull the blinds down because it's gone dark. And uh, I'm going to pull out the Annals of the Four Masters and read the passage concerned. As I was going over the far flung Curry Mountains, I saw Captain Tarrell and his money, he was counting. 
I first produce me pistol. And I then reduce me rape. Sing, stand and deliver, for you are a bold deceiver. What did I say? AM3656. Let me find this. I sound a little bit... Uh, who am I trying to do an impression of there, by the way? Um... Yeah, there's a particular movie character. He was also a book character that I'm trying to emulate there very poorly. Um, three, six. What did I say? Three, six, five, six. Yeah, here we go. And you're all going quiet again. What is going on tonight? I think I'm putting people to sleep. Better stop telling those awful jokes. The age of the world, 3656. This was the 17th year above three score of Chirnvas as king over Ireland. Wow. 76 years. Really? 77 years. It was by him the following battles were gained over the race of Ever and others of the Irish, and foreigners besides. These are the battles. The Battle of Ella. Oh, do I have to read all those? No, I don't. What are we talking about here? We are supposedly looking at uh, the crowds of his people were destroyed in some mysterious way. It is by Chirnmas or Chirnvas also that gold was first smelted in Ireland. You hear that, Tom King? In Forra Arthur Liffe, it was Ochadon, an artificer, an artificer of the Farakolan that smelted it. It was by him that goblets and brooches were first covered with gold and silver in Ireland. It was by him that clothes were dyed purple, blue and green. It was in his reign that the three black rivers of Ireland burst forth, Thuvna, Thurum and Colum, their names. At the end of this year he died with the three-fourths of the men of Ireland about him, at the meeting of my Schlecht in Brethny, at the worshipping of Crom Croch, which was the chief idol of adoration in Ireland. This happened on the night of Samhain, precisely. It is from the genuflections which the men of Ireland made about Chirnmas here that the plain was named. Fascinating. What a song, help with the cleaning. Yes, indeed. We're all listening to your singing, says Ola. It can't be that good. Um, I'm sure you're all, um, yes, we're all listening. Honestly, we are. <laughs> Perhaps we are enchanted by it, says Lily. Happy Mythical Monday, says Ad Astral Music. Many happy returns. Thank you for joining us. Is the jet lag caused by the hour time change? Uh, Mavanway is cleaning up the kitchen while listening. Um, and obviously uh, the music may be helping that. So I'm not sure. Hello from Shanna Golden in Limerick, says Denny Hayes Carpentry. Hello, Denny. How's things? Are you good? Are you in good form? I hope you are. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're enjoying the, the story, the scale. Where were we? Crom Croak is in this book, the Book of Leinster, called the chief idol of Ireland, Ri Idol Nairn, and in the Rhind in Shenachas, we are told that, quote, until Patrick's advent, he was the god of every folk that colonized Ireland, unquote. In the main, facts regarding Crum Croch, the secular literature is corroborated by the lives of St. Patrick. In the tripartite life, it is stated that this idol was adored by King Lyra and by many others, and that Patrick, 
setting out from Granard, went straight to my Schlecht and overthrew the whole 13. He's actually specifically said, I'm not sure what the source is, but Patrick was specifically said to have destroyed the idol of Crum Crook by smashing it with a sledgehammer. In the same authority, we read that a chief named Folge Berge had adopted Ken Crook as his special god, and that he attempted to kill Patrick in revenge for destroying it. Crum Croak and its 12 attendant idols were pillar stones covered with gold and bronze. And in the Dunchanachus in the Book of Leinster, after speaking of them, remarks that from time to from the time of Heramon, that's the first king of the Milesians, to the coming of the good Patrick of Armagh, there was adoration of stones in Ireland. The remains of these 13 idols were in my Schlecht at the time of the compilation of the tripartite life, 8th to 10th century, for it states, quote, the mark of the staff, i.e. the staff of Jesus, St. Patrick's Crozier, still remains on its left side. And it goes on to say that the other 12 were also to be seen, buried up to their heads in the earth as Patrick had left them. Fascinating. It's interesting because people think, some people in the modern era think that this refers to, you know, the destruction of pre-Christian monuments by the Christians. And while there may have been some of that, by and large, they left them alone. How do we know that? Because most of them are still standing today, or a great deal of them. And those that have disappeared, disappeared in the last few centuries. Uh, the Christians did much less damage uh, to monuments than people think. That's an interesting one about Bacho Ishu. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm allowed to specifically mention this. So uh, maybe the person who... Uh, Gave it to me. You might just give me the the okay, but this is um, a nineteenth century copy of uh, a history of Ireland by um, Mary, Sister Mary Frances Cusack. She's known as the is it the nun of Kenmare, um, uh, and uh, a beautiful uh, a book. This one actually published. It's not a first edition, but it's the closest thing you're going to get to a really beautiful uh, original, uh, which is 1868. Yep. And uh, I wonder whether this staff that was Patrick's Crozier that's mentioned as being Jesus's staff is the Bachel issue, uh, which is mentioned in now. I wouldn't dare to make any margin marks in this book, but I have done in the paperback modern facsimile reprint that I have of it. So if you bear with Mary, me, me bear, bear with Mary, bear with me for a moment, I shall. First of all, I need to think about where it is before I go jumping up off the chair, thinking I can find it fairly handily. Uh, by right, it should be there, but it isn't. So where is it? The Nun of Kenmare. find it now ah sure it is there it's where i said it should be it's exactly where i said it should be mary francis cusick an illustrated history of ireland from 8400 to 1800 uh first published 1868 this edition 1995 by senate can i find the reference to the bachel issue <laughs> Can I? Can I? Can I? 
Mavander wants to uh, is asking, do you think there were gold or bronze statues? I'm not sure. I don't know. We've no. I don't think we've any record of such things. I really don't think so. I think my Schlecht, the Crom Crook, is likely to have been some sort of a, a stone circle. To be honest, there is like at Grange Stone Circle in Loch Gur, one of the stones is called Crom. Crom, which what's he called? What's the large stone at um, Grange Stone Circle called? It's Crom something. Bucks Avalanche says Joe. Yeah, I know. You pull one out, and you know, all of a sudden they're falling around all over the place because I haven't got enough shelf space. Oh, I'm sure I marked it. Um, this bit about the Bachel issue. Can he find it? Total, total rabbit hole distraction here. Totally ridiculous. Because the Bachel issue was, as far as I can remember, was held, was kept, was it swords in County Dublin? Um, and it survived. This is allegedly the staff of Jesus um, and was uh, allegedly survived until the time of the arrival of the Vikings and was destroyed during, was it the Battle of Clontarf? I'm not sure. Um, I can't find it. Damn, 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 damn. Cannot find it. But the stupid thing is, I should have, I absolutely should have. Sally Siggins is in the house. Crumb Dove, yes, not Crumb Crook. Crumb Dove is the Grange Stone Circle Stone. Yeah, Barbara Murphy's in the house. Late Anthony, in his own words, down a deep rabbit hole. <laughs> yes, hello, hello, Barbara. Um, so Brendan is saying St. Patrick carried a, cro a crozier and a sledgehammer. Well, allegedly. Um, Denny Hayes, grand stretch and evenings, yes, which Sally also mentions. Yeah, it's brilliant. We started while it was still bright earlier on. And uh, now let me let me let me just back up the bus here a second now. Um, Bachel issue. I wonder, did I? Uh, I thought I posted about it at some point, whether on the blog or on the on the Facebook. <clears throat> No, oh, can't find it. Damn. Have to leave it. Oh, one more, one more, one more thing to try is to search the PDF. If I have a PDF of that book, which I may have. Of course, where do I find it now amidst all the hundreds of PDFs? Um, what am I looking for? Mary Frances Cusack. Um, Cusack. You're all sitting there very patiently while I'm fumbling around. Um, no, I'm going to have to give up on that for now. And I tell you what always happens is when you're live on the live stream you can't find what you're looking for and literally 30 seconds after the broadcast is finished the book will just fall open on the correct page oh i wonder is there an index i mean in the 1860s i'm not sure that oh there is there is an index hey maybe that's what i should have just done in the first place look at the bloody index anthony bachel isha there you go 114 to 115 wow well would you know what do you know? Okay, bear with me a second. Let's read a little bit about Bachel issue. We're getting distracted a little bit, but only a little bit. Because we have already said that 
the remains of the crumb crook 13 stones which were apparently coated in silver and gold were present or still in situ uh, sometime between the 8th and 10th century when the tripartite life was composed because it says quote the mark of the staff i.e the staff of jesus st patrick's crozier still remains on its left side and it goes on to say that the other 12 were also to be seen buried up to their heads in the earth as patrick had left them now here we go St. Patrick retired to Italy after this vision and there spent many years. During this period, he visited Lerins, not sure how to pronounce that, uh, and other islands in the Mediterranean. Lerins was distinguished for its religious and learned establishments and probably Saint-Germain, Saint under whose direction the saint still continued, had recommended him to study there. It was at this time that he received the celebrated staff called the Bachel Ishu, or Staff of Jesus. St. Bernard mentions this Bachel issue in his life of St. Malachy. St. Bernard, of course, was in charge of the Cistercians at Clairvaux, and St. Malachy was the one who founded Melifont Abbey in 1142, the first of and the largest of the Cistercian abbeys in Ireland. As one of those insignia of the See of Armagh, which are popularly believed to confer upon the possessor a title to be regarded and obeyed as the successor, successor of St. Patrick. Indeed, the great antiquity of this long treasured relic has never been questioned, nor is there any reason to suppose that it was not in some way a miraculous gift. Frequent notices of this pastoral staff are found in ancient Irish history. Saint Fiach speaks of it as having been richly adorned by an ecclesiastical contemporary with the saint. A curious manuscript is still preserved at the Chapter House of Westminster Abbey, containing an examination of Sir Gerald McShane, Knight, sworn 19th of March 1529, upon the Holy Mass Book, H-O-L-I-E-M-A-S-E-B-O-O-K-E, -E -E, and the Great Relic of Ireland, presumably that's a misspelling of Ireland or a variant of Ireland, called Baculum Christi, in the presence of the King's Deputy, Chancellor, Treasurer and Justice, unquote. Perhaps it may be well to conclude the account of this interesting relic by a notice of its wanton destruction, as translated from the Annals of Loch K by Professor O'Curry. Quote, the most miraculous image of Mary, which was at Balia Oha Trim, Trim in the county of Meath, and which the Irish people had all honoured for a long time before that, which used to heal the blind, the deaf, the lame, and every disease in like manner, was burned by the Saxons, not the Danes. I apologise for that. And the staff of Jesus, sorry, uh, uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves here, just read it and stop commenting. And the staff of Jesus, which was in Dublin, and which wrought many wonders and miracles in Aaron since the time of Patrick down to that time, and which was in the hand of Christ himself, was burned by the Saxons in like manner. And not only that, but there was not a holy cross, nor an image of Mary, nor any other celebrated image in Aaron, over which their power reached, that they did not burn. Nor was there any one, sorry, nor was there one of the seven orders which came under their power, which they did not ruin. And the Pope and the Church in the East and at home were excommunicating the Saxons on that account, and they did not pay attention or heed unto that. And I'm not certain whether it was not in the year preceding above, AD 1537, that these relics were burned. And that is a significant time, isn't it? Because isn't that the decade in which the dissolution of the monasteries under Henry VIII occurred uh, and uh, the uh, Reformation was... Uh, 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 in in full swing. It turns out I hadn't actually marked uh, in the margins. Bachel, B-A-C-H-A-L-L, Bachel Ishu, I-S-U, the Staff of Jesus. So there you go. And that's in Mary Frances Cusack's Illustrated History of Ireland. And I health also have uh, and an 18 what did i say 1868 um i think it's a second edition because there's a preface to the first edition at the beginning of the book and is there also a preface to the second edition maybe there isn't maybe this is a first edition uh for which i'm feeling suddenly very embarrassed yes it is but there is only a preface to the first edition so it's probably a first edition fantastic
Someone overlay. David Attenborough, a real life researcher in the wild. And here, on the fringes of Cavan, we have a most remarkable remnant of the past, the idol of Crom Crook. I'm going to have to break out the whiskey if he keeps going, says Rex. Fair enough. I'm not stopping you. But come here, share it round. In the western parts of Connacht, there was another remarkable idol called Crumb Dove. And the first Sunday in August, as the anniversary of dest its destruction, is still called in Munster and Connacht, Dalnach Crumb Dove, Crumb Dove's Sunday. O'Flaherty identifies Crumb Dove with Crumb Croak. So this is interesting, Sally, um, because we were talking about that large stone at Grange Stone Circle, which is called Crumb Dove. But apparently somebody thinks O'Flaherty, who is the composer of one of the Irish histories, is, isn't he? Isn't O'Flaherty one of the, he, he wrote a history of Ireland two centuries ago or something like that. Is that the same O'Flaherty? Mind you, there is a footnote here which says that Flaherty, O'Flaherty is probably wrong in this. Todd asserts that Dalna Crumb Dove was Sunday before that was the Sunday next before Samhain, or the 1st of November. But this cannot be, for to this day, the first Sunday in August is, in Clare and Munster, generally called Down at Crumb Dove, and also Garland Sunday, which the people down to her own time celebrated there as a sort of festival. And of course, that fact that it was called Down at Crumb Dove is very widely attested in Moira McNeil's wonderful book, The Festival of Lunasa. As Crumb Crook was the idol king, in quotes, of all Ireland, there was a special idol god called Carmond Kelstach that presided over Ulster. This stone idol was still preserved in the porch of the Cathedral of Clogher down to the time of the analyst Cahill Maguire, who died in 1498, as he himself tells us. Well, that's fascinating. Like, uh, why would you keep a, a stone idol in the porch of a cathedral? Answer me that. Shay Payne says, good times. Was he talking books? Barbara Murphy, will you pay attention at the back of class? If you're going to arrive in late, will you at the very least give us the dignity of, of your full and undivided attention, please? Thank you. Uh, there you go. At uh, right 100 lines, I shall listen more attentively in class. Wasn't Croke Patrick originally a site for Crumb Dove? Yeah, the whole thing is about Patrick overcoming this pre-Christian idol or deity and probably what it is is uh, uh in mythological terms is a new sun god vanquishing the old you know uh brendan burn not today fighting with Burn. okay not for me i think i fully caught up i think barbara a a a uh, i was gonna say recantive a a uh uh a regretful uh, Barbara is now saying, I shall listen. <laughs> you know me. I don't care. It's not that I don't care. I just, yeah, it's fun. We're here to learn. Uh, I can imagine. Imagine if I was. Imagine this was live and you were all in a room in front of me. Like, we wouldn't. There's just no way. Like, you know, just The whole thing would descend into com comedic farce, you know. It'd be very funny. Pillar stones were worshipped in other parts of Ireland, as well as at Moishlecht and Clogher. In the Brehan Laws, one of the objects for marking the boundaries of land is stated to be a stone of worship. Lea Adrada, or uh, if you put in the Lenitian, Lea Ira, from Lea a stone and Ara a worship. This interesting record at once connects the Irish custom with the Roman worship of the god Terminus, which god as in Ireland, was merely a pillar stone placed standing in the ground to mark the boundary of two adjacent properties. And of course, we still, until very recent times, uh, we still have, uh, as published in the last in last year's uh, journal of the old Drogheda Society, it was a very interesting article about milestones. I think there are 13 of them in the vicinity of Drogheda, or boundary stones that mark the boundary of the old borough of Drogheda. So we've been doing this for centuries and centuries, and actually for thousands of years, you know. 
Shay Payne wants to know if lay off the anti-pagan juice merch is on the way. <laughs> Brilliant. Yes. What a superb idea, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that something I actually said earlier, was it? Lay off the anti-pagan juice. <laughs> Brilliant. Even to this day, some of these old idol or oracle stones are known. And the memory of the rites performed at them is preserved in popular legend. See, despite the influence of Christianity in calling all these things idols and assuming that they're all evil and they're all dark and they're all against Christianity and they're something that we shouldn't worship, they're still preserved in popular legend. What does that tell you? Two miles from Strad Valley in Waterford, just beside a bridge over a little stream falling into the River Tay, is a remarkable rock still called Cluch Lawrish, the Speaking Stone. Not to be confused with the Holy Stone of Clonrickert, a class two relic, uh, which, has been given its, which has given its name to the bridge. There is a very vivid tradition in the county Waterford, and indeed all over Munster, I heard it in Limerick, that in pagan times it gave responses and decided causes. Sounds a little bit like our Leofoa foil, Leofo oil, the understone that screamed under the king. But on one occasion, a wicked woman perjured herself in its presence, appealing to it to witness her truthfulness when she was really lying, whereupon it split in two and never spoke again. Wow. There were speaking stones in other parts of Ireland, and one of them has given name to the present townland of Clonorish near Ennis Corthy in County Wexford. The Welsh too. Yes, indeed, Mavanway uh, Jinx. Kathy Deo is Kathy, that is Kathy May, still so busy. Have a great week. Well, I'm glad that you were able to say hello, Kathy May. Hello, and uh, hope you're in good form. And hopefully, you get to watch the replay. If we were all in the library together, we'd be in trouble for talking and drooling on the books. <laughs> yeah, there would just be no settling you down. It would be worse than a class of primary school children, you know. One of the surnames in my family was Brehan. I wonder if they were connected to the Brehan Laws. Is that an Irish name, Scott? One second. I'm going to go down a small rabbit hole here. Yes. Uh, let me see if such a name is recorded in all Ireland surnames. Oh, his eyes going over. There's no Brehen, but there's a Brehenny, B R E H E N E. Sorry, E N Y. Mach on Brehavon. Judge, son of the judge. Mm, that's interesting. This name has generally been generally changed to judge, but it also occur, occurs as Abraham. The variant Brehon is rare. Ah, there you go. Wow. B R E H O N. There you are. Look. Look. Zoom in on that. Take a screenshot right now. Hang on. Let me just get this focused and zoomed. So you're looking under Brehany here and the variant Brehan there. Look, take a screenshot of that. So quite possibly is the answer. Oh. Focus, Anthony. Fascinating. Yes, indeed. Good, good, good. But they changed it to judge. Yeah, exactly. Okay, whiskey's all around, says Rex. <laughs> uh, yes, they changed it to judge. Joe Butler is giving us the rabbit and hole symbol. Down the rabbit hole we go, yet again. Well, if I go down a rabbit hole, if going down a rabbit hole means that Rex is showering us with whiskies let's do the rabbit hole let's do the rabbit hole again 
I shall finish up shortly because we've been going for an hour. So I'll uh, I'll just read another page and then we'll we'll halt for this week and come back to it next week. The Welsh too had their speaking stone and called it by the same Celtic name, only using lech or lech, a stone instead of cloch. Well, lech is mean means a stone here too. This is mentioned by Geraldus Cambrensis, who calls it by its Welsh name lech lower correctly rendering, rendered by him as the speaking stone. In his time, it formed a bridge across a small stream, and he relates a legend how it once spoke, and also how, on a certain occasion, it cracked in the middle, like our Clochlorish, which crack, he says, is still to be seen. Wow. The word lech, Irish lech, L-E-C, is used here, as it is the proper word, both in Irish and Welsh, for a flat flagstone. The fact that the speaking stone superstition is common to both Irish and Welsh shows that they must have had it from a period before the separation of these two Celtic branches, centuries before the Christian era. Uh, Joe is absolutely right. You have to be careful. Don't mix whiskey and books too much. What happens if you mix alcohol and literature? You get tequila mockingbird. I'll get my coat. Stones that uttered musical and other sounds are sometimes mentioned in Irish tales. The most remarkable of these was the Leofoil, or inauguration stone at Tara, which roared when a king of the true Scotic or Milesian race stood on it. Like the Egyptian vocal Memnon, which uttered musical sounds when it received the rays of the rising sun. We are not told that any of these Irish vocal stones were worshipped, but they were probably connected by a distant, by a sort of distant cousinship with the acknowledged stone idols. Stones as well as fountains and trees were worshipped on the continent as well as in Britain, even so late as the 10th or 11th century. Uh, and the three are often mentioned in the ecclesiastical canons as objects of worship. In Ireland, as we see in this section and in section eight, stones and wells were worshipped, but though certain kinds of trees were in some degree venerated, I cannot find that any trees were actually worshipped. There you go. Another name in my Irish family is Dunn. I heard it means dark, but so does Dove. Is there a connection there or am I wrong? Dunn, I think Dunn can mean brown, isn't it? Um, uh, but I will look. I'm happy to look it up for you. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Don. D O N N means brown, but it is pronounced sort of D U N N N. D U N N N N N. D U N N. Don. Let me have another look. Oh, Din. Brown. I think. Let me have a look. Done with or without the E on the end. Very numerous. Down, Midlands, Southeast Leinster, South Leinster etc. Irish O'Dwin. Don equals brown. Two septs. One of the Eregon. Eregon is that Reagan? Leash. And the other of Tara in Meath. Oh, there you go. There you go. Very, very useful book to have, by the way. Uh, All Ireland Surnames by Sean de Vulv. Fascinating book. I mean, it doesn't give, there isn't um, uh, comprehensive information about any name, but there's information about most names, which is uh, valuable. Is Siggins in there? asks Sally. Let me have a look. Do -do -do -do. Do -do -do -do. Siggins, Rare, Sligo, etc. Irish Shigeen, S I G I for the N. They were Anglo Normans, 13th century, long associated with Wexford, derived from Teutonic first name Siggy Vic Victory. See also Shiggins <coughs> with a H. Let me have a look at Shiggins. Rare, Wexford, C. Siggins. So there you go. Originally, uh, Anglo-Normans landed in Wexford and uh, apparently mostly 
uh, confined to Sligo these days. It says Slayer, rare, Slayer. <laughs> it says rare Sligo, etc. Wow. Fascinating stuff. I um, don't know what's wrong with my keyboard. Stop doing that. Stop trying to paste stuff in there. I'm not trying to give them links to stuff. Thanks, a great bunch of lads. <laughs> you talk about the Normans. What have the Normans ever done for us, eh? Um, what section will you be launching into next time? Once for, uh, Rex wants to know. Um, Rex, we are on page 278. Uh, it's Religion, Learning and Art, and it's section 5, which is called Worship of Idols. I wonder if, how long does that continue before we get into the next section? Then we get on to human sacrifice. Oh, wow. And worship of weapons and worship of the elements. So, yeah, quite a while to go on that chapter yet. 278. While we contemplate the input of religious scripts in history, Anthony continues to mix Thin Lizzy with the Rocky Horror Show. Things get jumbled in history. Yeah, I um, prefer the Dubliners version. Uh, anybody free for a tour of Newgrange tomorrow? Can't make it, but happy to pass it on to anyone interested, says Paul McCulloch. Um, yeah, yeah, how would that work? Um, given that <coughs> they, <coughs> they have to have the tickets for tomorrow, you know, that's an interesting um point. Sorry, I'm just checking something here. Why don't we uh, just have a top up? It will help. Are you talking about whiskey? Rex, did you pass it round? Um, yeah, so if anybody has, it's just one ticket, uh, Paul, is it? Um, yeah, so if anybody has. An interest mind you there are still a few tickets available anyway um but um yeah that's unfortunate but not to worry sure maybe we might see it again you know um now is mayo in your book anthony mayo in which book though <coughs> in which of my uh nine books uh, are you talking about there is mention of mayo in island of the setting sun specifically this revised edition and the one that's currently available uh, in relation to the excuse me the patrick alignment this alignment across the country from slain to croak patrick croak patrick being in county mayo um oh you mean Sorry, am I getting confused? Sorry, you mean the surname Mayo. Thank you. Sorry, should have guessed. The surname Mayo. Let me have a look. Mayo. Mayo. M-A-Y-O. No, it's not. We have May... And M A Y M A Y M A Y E and M A Y E S Maybury Maybin Maybury Maycock Mayers Mayhew Mayland Maynard Maine Oh Mayo Sorry <laughs> I'm really having one of those nights. I think I just need to go to bed and lie down. Very rare Ballymena Antrim Irish Machmayu M A Father I G H I U Father from first name Matthew. So it literally means son of Matthew. Machmayu. Or Mayo on its own is literally an anglicization of Matthew. The Irish. An anglicization of the Irish version of Matthew. If that makes sense. Ballymena Antrim. Very rare. Machmayu. From first name Matthew. SGA. Now what's SGA? That's possibly pointing us to another publication but is there a, a list of abbreviations uh 
lower lower Lister. What is SGA? Quick answer is I don't know. Unfortunately. Unless it's in the back rather than the front of the book. No. So I can't help you with that. Don't know where the S what the SGA source is. There you go. I have a great grandmother with that surname. Wow. And it's very rare. Johnny Wilson is saying hello from Dallas, Texas. Good afternoon to you, Johnny. Hope you're in good form. Um, and we're just at the end, actually, of this episode. So the automatic captioning strikes again. Father equals father, lol. <laughs> I can just imagine what some of those uh, <coughs> captions are like. Those... Uh, the subtitles are like on, on, on former episodes of this Live Irish Mits. I'd say some of them are quite hilarious, to be honest, you know. Anyway, uh, that's it. Shin eh? Shin will. I'll see uh, some of you, hopefully, tomorrow at Newgrange Farm. The first of uh, this season's tours. Um, and uh, don't forget, there's plenty coming during the summer. So plenty of time to book if you're not on tomorrow's. Uh, Ali wants to know, uh, Godsill. Yeah, well, uh, but this is specifically, yeah, you see all Ireland surnames, but there are a lot of names in Ireland that obviously come from Britain, you know. Let me check. Godsell. Let me see if it's there. Godsell. Also, uh, so G-O-D-S-E-L-L, -L, also ending G-O-D-S-I-L-L. Godsell with two L's. Um. Uh, fairly rare cork English meaning good soul 17th century is what he says about it anyway uh, don't forget to come back next week for more and uh, yeah the evenings are getting longer unless of course you're in Australia or New Zealand your days are getting shorter but uh, come on we're not you, you know, you don't have to be jealous of us. You've got much warmer temperatures than we have. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll see you all next week for uh, the next part in the series and for the next episode. Don't forget, please do have a look at Patreon. There's lots of stuff on there that isn't being shared widely on the social media. And hope uh, to uh, catch up with you next week and uh, keep an eye on the social media and on the U YouTube in the, in the meantime. For other updates and of course the website don't forget to subscribe to the emails on the website because everybody who subscribes to the email list between now and the 15th of april will get a free 10 euro voucher for the mythical Ireland website that includes everybody who's currently subscribed so get over there now and get on there i should have mentioned that at the start typically uh anthony mentions it at the very end i'll just share that link before i say good night in the meantime all that remains for me to say is Ihoa Kolosov, Sloan Gafol, and Toga Buggy. We're looking forward to New Grange tomorrow, and we'll see you very soon. <laughs>